right, we'll get started here in just a minute if we can settle in. All right, welcome everybody to our next installment of our food conversation series. Um, tonight we're going to be continuing our work on food waste. Um, but let's uh, start off with a land acknowledgement. We stand on the homelands of the Dakota nations. We honor with gratitude the people who have stewarded the land throughout the generations and their ongoing contributions to this region. We acknowledge the ongoing injustices that we have committed against the Dakota and Ojibwe nations. And we wish to interrupt this legacy beginning with acts of healing and honest storytelling about this place. Okay. And then we will do our chalice lighting. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith, a faith that calls us together to the sacred community that is act for the earth, where in recognition of the holiness of the interconnected web of all life and the inherent worth of every being, we commit again to work within, among, and beyond ourselves to make reality justice, wholeness, and equity for all people, for the earth, and for all life on it. So um, we have some fun ahead of us tonight. Let's see if I can get the clicker to work. Is that not? OK. Um, so I'm going to be doing just a little bit of an introduction kind of to set the stage um, for the, the series here, um, since we're down now into the third one here. And then we have our group from First Universalists who are going to present on food storage and keeping things in your out of the dumpster. Um, and then we'll have a little Q&A and a stump the chef. So we're going to be getting creative, thinking about how to use our things in our refrigerator instead of running to the store for that one ingredient for that other recipe. Um, so then we we'll get to actually share those and vote on a winner. So whoop, whoop. which way are we going? OK, um, so Act for the Earth is um, sponsoring this series. And one of the things that we have been doing um, in this last year is exploring uh, active hope. And this is a, a it's actually a spiritual practice. Um, so we're, we're trying to integrate these into all of our work. Um, and really, I like the sub, I put this up here because how to face this mess we're in with unexpected resilience and creative power, because oftentimes with our group, we, especially we're a lot of doers, we're out there doing things, but we need to keep the energy and not despair because it's kind of a rough time out there right now. So anyway, um, just we're just gonna introduce this a little bit. Whoops, it went the wrong, what's it going? It's not going the way it said it would. Okay, here we go, sorry. Um, so one of the spiritual practices is called the spiral and you can use that to um, kind of keep yourself from getting stuck um, as far as negativity, being totally stuck, uh, being freaked out. <laughs> uh, so anyway, the four stages, we always start with gratitude um, and with gratitude, it, it just makes you feel better to, to really acknowledge what you're grateful for. It helps to build trust and generosity among the people that you're with. And it really show, focuses, shifts your focus from what's missing to what's already there. So we need to appreciate the wonderful gifts that we all have. Um, and then the next stage is going into honoring the pain. And um, this is something our group has been spending a little bit more time with, because I think we t a lot of us tend to brush over it um, or stuff it in the side and ignore it. <laughs> um, so anyway, the, there's a lot of ways to react to change. It can be fear, anger, guilt, hopelessness, just being, and this is a place where I think where a lot of people just kind of get stuck and don't feel like they can do anything or they just want to stick their head in the sand and pretend there's nothing bad happening right now. So. 
but there's a lot to happen with honoring the pain. What it does is really, um, it really opens your heart to see new possibilities and um, move forward. And uh, you need to get that crap out <laughs> in order to, to be able to keep going. Um, then we move through the next stage seen with new eyes, which can be ha happening both with just a lot of what we're doing here tonight is educating. You, one of the things you can do is really just educate yourself and learn and start seeing things like, oh, I never thought of that before. I can I do have agency here. Um, and working with others, that really helps. And then going forth is actually going out and doing it yourself and with people and get your policymakers to do the work as well. So anyway, um, we are going to start with a bit of gratitude. I'm going to read just a part of the Hodasashani. I practice this over and over. Hodasashani Thanksgiving Address. I had come across this with uh, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. Brenda Kimmerer had mentioned it. And they've actually, it's mentioned in the Joanna Macy book here as well. Um, it's a, <clears throat> It's been described as instructions that were given to the six nations of the Hodasashani Confederacy to acknowledge all life by the creator at the beginning of Turtle Island. It's a it's a greeting of gratitude, not just giving thanks once a year, but each and every day. And um, they often use this at the beginning of their meetings. So there's tribes coming together and um, working together. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to read a part of this. And after each section, we say together, now our minds are one. So you can follow along with me with that. So, <sighs> the people. Today we have gathered and we see that the cycles of life continue. We may have been given our duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Now our minds are one. Thank you. The Earth Mother. We are all thankful to our mother, the Earth, for she gives us all that we need for life. She supports our feet as we walk upon her. It gives us joy that she continues to care for us as she has from the beginning of time. To our mother, we send greetings and thanks. The Waters. We give thanks to all the waters of the world for quenching our thirst and providing us with strength. Water is life. We know its power in many forms, waterfalls and rain, mists and streams, rivers and oceans. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the spirit of water. The fish. We turn our minds to all of the fish in the water. They were instructed to cleanse and purify the water. They also give themselves to us as food. We are grateful that we can still find pure water, so we turn now to the fish and send our greetings and thanks. The plants. Now we turn toward the vast fields of plant life. As far as the eye can see, the plants grow, working many wonders. They sustain many life forms. With our minds gathered together, we give thanks and look forward to seeing plant life for many generations to come. the food plants. With one mind, we turn to honor and thank all of the food plants we harvest from the garden. Since the beginning of time, the grains, vegetables, beans, and berries have helped the people survive. Many other things draw strength from them too. We gather all the plant foods together as one and send them a greeting of thanks. Now we turn to all the medicine herbs of the world. From the beginning, they were instructed to take away sickness. They are always waiting and ready to heal us. We are happy there are, there are still among us those special few who remember how to use these plants for healing. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the medicines and the keepers of the medicines. The animals. We gather our minds together to send greetings and thanks to all the animal life in the world. They have many things to teach us as people. We are honored by them and they give up their lives so that we may use their bodies as food for our people. We see them near our homes and in the deep forests. 
We are glad they are still here and we hope they always will be so. The trees. Now we turn our thoughts to the trees. The earth has many families of trees who have their own instructions and uses. Some provide us with shelter and shade, other with fruit, fruit, beauty, and useful things. Many people of the world use a tree as a symbol of peace and strength. With one mind, we greet and thank the tree of life. Tree life. <laughs> And now closing words. We have now arrived at the place where we end our words. Of all the things we've named, it was not our intention to leave anything out. If something was forgotten, we leave it to each individual to send such greetings and thanks in their own way. Now our minds are one. <laughs> all right. Thank you for participating in that. All right. Um, lastly. Wrong thing. Oh, not that. Oh, where's the other? There's two other, sh the other sh slides. Yeah. Anyway, um, just wanted to uh, give some kind. I'm now I'm trying to get my brain, not having this slide to guide me. <laughs> Acknowledging the pain. Um, we uh, do want to. We did open our series with a t uh, Food Too Good to Waste, the movie. Um, and there's a link to that, I think, out in the hallway even, or there's you can get to it different ways. But um, highlighting kind of the issue of food waste. Um, also, we're doing some research into Project Drawdown. Um, I have the printout here that was on a slide, but um, anyway, it, sh it illustrates um, kind of the, the percentage weight or the impact of doing different things to help decrease our carbon emissions in the world. Um, and the first here in the orange is the electrical. Um, so getting off of fossil fuels is like the number one thing that as far as impact to improve. Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So this is just showing how you can go fall into despair really readily these days because these highlights are in the in the news like every week. It seems it's you could really get stifled and stopped with just I don't know fear anxiety. I have to deal with my anxiety regularly. Um, but uh, so anyway, to move forward with that, we want to. We want to honor that pain and we just spend more time with that, but you got to join our group to get more involved with that <laughs> or other other groups. So here's the, the picture I was showing. So there's the electricity, the fossil, it's kind of, it's all done by percentages. So um, the electricity is the, the biggest by far, but the next one is food, agriculture, and land use. And I was surprised by this. I don't know if anybody else was that surprised, but it addresses, and then if you look at um, the three little circles or the sub-circles there, the biggest one is address waste and diet. So it's huge. It's a really big potential impact. So, and this is something we can, can have a role in. The other thing that is, so the top line is showing ways to take carbon emissions out of the atmosphere. This is a way you can help put carbon back. It's a carbon sink. And this is all agriculture. So there is definitely a big relationship of dealing with our relationship with food and the land um, to helping our earth. So anyway, with that, we are going to move forward. I'm gonna have Lisa introduce the group here for us. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna do this very briefly. Um, our friends from First Universalist Church are way ahead of us in this. They've been doing this work for a number of years, and I am just very happy that they agreed to come and, um, and, and teach us and be with us tonight. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to them.
Is that it? Good. So, thank you. Oh my, pewee, that and bad. Hate it when my leftovers look so sad. If you like me, don't want to feel sorry, come listen all about food storage. Let's listen all about food storage. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to our presentation on food storage. I'm Janet, and this is Betsy and Katie, and we're members of the First Universalist Church's Food Solutions Team, a subgroup of our environmental justice team. As we all know, food is a big deal. We need it to stay alive and to thrive. It's chock full of likes and dislikes, cravings and chemistry, emotional connections and memories, family and cultural ties, and long-standing traditions. Food Solutions focuses on educating folks make, to make healthy, sustainable, plant-based food choices. We like to cook and can sometimes be found in the big kitchen at First Universalist Church happily preparing a tasty vegan meal to share as part of a Wednesday evening program. According to Project Drawdown, the world's leading resource for climate solutions and a touchstone for our environmental justice team, plant-based food choices, if adopted on a global scale, will have one of the biggest and most easily accessible impacts on global warming. Changing the way we eat is scientifically proven to help have a positive effects on our health. Has a significant spiritual aspect too. Extending compassion to our fellow sentient beings on this planet helps us live in accordance with the seventh UU principle of respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we are all part. And speaks to our spiritual sources of earth-based traditions that instruct us to live in harmony with nature. Storing our food properly is an important way of reducing food waste. Food waste, we're learning, is a major contributor to global warming, and it's a big problem. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, 40% of all food intended for human consumption um, in the U.S. goes uneaten. All the inputs in the production, processing, transporting, preparing, and storing this discarded food have a significant CO2 greenhouse input. And when food decays in landfills, it generates methane, an even more potent greenhouse gas. And surprisingly, most of the food that's going to waste is not from industry or restaurants, but from our very own houses. That was an eye-opener for me. Our local Hennepin County Waste Management tells us that in just one year, Hennepin County throws away enough food to fill Target Field one and a half times. So what's a person to do? Katie and Betsy will tell us more about how to safely save and store our food so we waste less and take another important step towards becoming better stewards of the earth. Thanks, Janet. So how do we store food so it doesn't become waste? I'm going to show you a few ideas and then we'll have the opportunity to talk at our tables a little bit because I don't know about you, but if my friends have success doing something, that's kind of a good way for me to adopt it myself. Um, part of this presentation we're using with permission from Hennepin County, where our food solutions team member Kira Berglund works as a composting and recycling specialist. So who taught you where to put produce? like fridge, counter. For me, it was my mom and she learned from her mom. They usually got it right. But um, as an adult, I think I learned a few things like, for example, potatoes and onions, they risk sprouting if you put them right next to each other, for example. So let's talk about short-term storage first. So that's less than two weeks. 
So we have some of these printed guides up here if anyone wants to come up after. And some folks like using apps. Food Keeper is a great one. But my favorite is savethefood.com. And I know our team members here love savethefood.com too. When, whenever I get like a new vegetable for my CSA and I don't know how to store it properly or what to do with it, there's a really great storage section here and you can put any food, choose from the menu and learn all about it. So it's a really great trick. And then a note about food expiration dates. So there's lots of dates that say like use by, best by, reminder that those are really indicators of quality, uh, not safety, except for, for baby formula. So just use your senses. If I see uh, this piece of cheese that has a little mold, I usually will just cut it off. Use your senses, smell, you know. Um, this apple looks like a great candidate for my compost bin. Um, wilty greens, I love just um, blanching them and then cutting them up for my smoothies in the, in the freezer. Okay, let's talk about the fridge. So um, does anyone have a guess the bottom part of your fridge, do you think it's the coldest or the warmest part of your fridge? Coldest. Yeah. So if you're a dairy or meat eater, the bottom is a really good place to store those. Uh, I actually learned a lot of, uh, about this just now, but, um, the door is the warmest part. So that's a great place to store your condiments. And then the top and middle part of your fridge, a lot of folks like Betsy over here, have a sign that says, eat me first. And that's kind of a fun place to store your uh, leftovers or things you really want to eat up. Um, some people have crisper drawers that have humidity levels. And I didn't realize this, but my fridge did have it. And high humidity, if you set one on that, is really great for veggies and leafy greens. It will make them last longer. Low humidity is good for produce that rots quickly, like apples, melon, mushrooms, things like that. And then my favorite long-term storage. So freezing for me is the very easiest thing to do. Um, we Betsy's going to go a little bit further into the plastic issue, which is another thing that can complicate food storage. But it's really easy for lots of fruits and veggies, even meat and bread to, if they're going to go bad, just freeze them. Here's a picture of my freezer right now. So you can see, um, this is where I store my organics recycling in the city of Minneapolis, just because it helps in the summer with fruit flies for our family. So we do that, but my neighbor just gave me a ton of apples and I made applesauce. So that's a great way to, um, if you have like glass jars, make sure to leave an inch of space so that when it freezes, it has room. Uh, oh, this is just my, my setup that I do. So I do my organics in, in my bin. And then I have another one that goes in my compost in my backyard. And then some other things to keep long-term storage. How does it last longer? Drying. Drying is really great. I don't have a dehydrator, but I, I do a lot of herbs in my oven at a low temperature. Some people even do meat and things like that. Here's a picture of my mint plant right before it snowed on, I think it was like Halloween, the day before Halloween this year. And so I just make my tea that way. And then some folks love doing jam and pickling. My favorite ways are just the short, short fridge ones that are easier. Um, Here's a picture of mine right now. Easy fridge jam, easy fridge pickles, my sourdough starter Dwayne in there. Um, and then just one other favorite resource of mine, the Zero Waste Chef taught me a lot about foods that um, are the top wasted foods. Anyone have a guess about one of the top five wasted foods in America? Strawberries is a great one. Anyone else? Bananas? Apples. Good one. Banana, strawberries, apples. You guys got the top three. Good job. So there's lots of things you can do with those if you think they're going to go bad. Uh, the Zero Waste Chef also taught me about scraps. This is my apple cores that I was talking about, my applesauce. You can make little apple scrap vinegar. Lots of things you can do. So I thought we could just take a minute and just discuss at your tables. Do you have any tricks or tools that you use to help stay fresh? Or we could do it as a group. What do you, let's do as, as a group. Okay. Okay.
Yeah. Right. Right. Mm hmm Right. That's a great question. I think it's different for everything. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. The question is really about those use by dates and how they change when an item is opened. And I guess my answer is I think it's different for every food and really just use your senses. Another question? Okay. That's a great point. If you have food you can't eat up, you put it in the freezer and it will last longer. That's great. Love it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's very cool. Okay. Great point. I'll just repeat that. For yeah. That's really cool. So this person was saying they grow herbs in their backyard and then chop them up to on the dock. Yep. And chop them up. And, and it's a great thing to freeze. The university of Minnesota extension has great tips for doing that. Thank you. Anyone else have any tricks that they do? I've been freezing milk. Yeah. So I, I usually buy a half gallon of milk in a, in a glass jar from Kowalski's and that's a lot more milk than I drink in, you know, before it goes bad. And so I just, I just did it today. I put it into six uh, Mason jars, you know, three quarter, maybe two thirds full and uh, in the freezer. And it, it turns a really funky sort of yellow opaque color, but when you take it out and thaw it, it looks just like it did when it was fresh. Thanks, Lisa. Cool. Yeah. One over here. This is a follow-up for Lisa. Um, when you do that, is it skim milk? Skim milk? Really? Okay. Because I've done buttermilk and cream and half and half, same thing. I buy it in larger containers that is more economical, and then I portion, portion it out into glasses. But it does sort of separate. the. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, it's fine for baking with, but I'm not sure I drink it, but yeah. Yeah. Um, what about the nutritional value of something frozen after a certain stage? I mean, I, I think in some ways people have had the bias that fresh is best, but I've also heard that Oftentimes, um, in, if you freeze something right away, you're freezing in the freshness, if you will, if you freeze it properly. If you leave something in the freezer too long, you got a separate problem. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know the answer to that. Does anyone else know? I Well, I, I know that there's a, a standard average, 8 to 12 months, but then there's always specifics and so there are organizations it's like the extension may have more information and then there's another group called um let's see i have it here um the national center for home food preservation you can get details about a specific food but in general and you're right you have to freeze it in a timely way and properly and if you do that Eight, eight to 12 months on average. It's a long time. 
And that that it you know also assumes that your the temperature controls are steady. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I when you have that call for a tablespoon of tomato paste. I put the other ones in ice cube. I divvy it out in ice cube trays because it's about a tablespoon when they always call for a tablespoon or two and then put it in the freezer. Love it. Anyone else have an idea? Sure. Yeah, so the question was about how I do my easy fridge pickles. So sometimes I actually like follow the recipe and do like canning pickles, but usually I just make a brine and then cut up a, a cucumber and throw it in there. It's one of the few things my nine-year-old loves. So I always have a cucumber in the brine. It doesn't last as long, but I don't know how long it actually lasts, but I just smell it. I reuse the brine a couple times and then start fresh. Yeah. Oh yeah. So the, 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 what is it called? Apple scrap vinegar. I just went to zero chef.com and she makes a lot of things with fruit tops, like strawberry tops. She makes the strawberry soda with, um, and then the apple cores, uh, you just add water and sugar and let it sit on the counter um, so that, yeah, she has the details on her site. So look at that on there. Yeah. All right. Oh, one more. Okay. I would say a lot of people make pesto and you can freeze pesto uh, in a flat plastic bag and it's easy to use in that you know that scale love pesto great one all right well betsy i'm going to turn over to you thank you thank you yeah yeah the questions are great <clears throat> i thought like with the apple jack whatever it is vinegar it's not just vinegar i was thinking you poured vinegar over the the apple cores oh no i just oh Okay, so I learned something new. Okay, so what I'm focusing on is two areas. The best containers to use for storing food and tips for preparing foods for storage. So safety is a, can everyone hear me? Okay, it's a, obviously a very key consideration for food storage containers. And that means that is made from natural materials that do not contain or leak toxins into the foods. It is, it's so basic. Uh, <clears throat> and being airtight and durable are also important and heat, heat resistant is definitely a, a benefit, but safety is really key. So these eight materials are considered the best for storage. Glass, of stainless steel, silicone, cotton cloth wraps, that would be beeswax and dish towels, ceramics and bamboo. Um, and uh, by the way, does anyone notice what's missing from that list of good containers? Plastic. Plastics are so toxic. They're made from chemicals from planet warming, gas, oil, and coal. They disrupt and they harm not only human and animal health, plant health, everything in the environment and the climate just help to disrupt the climate as well. Many of them are hormone disruptors, including bisphenols. I'm sure you've heard about those. PVC, polystyrene, and uh, although the FDA now regulates some of the bisphenols, not all of them, they have regrettably, regrettably stamped as food safe other categories of chemicals such as polypropylene and low and high density polyethylene as well. The truth is these, it's unbelievable. They're so-called safe 
but they are not safe for the environment. Maybe they're safer for human health, but they are not safer for the environment. So I encourage all of us to honor the earth by reducing our use of plastic. It's, it is not easy, but it definitely can be done. And I'm gonna show you what I did with my freezer. <laughs> my, so back to the uh, materials. My, my favorite happens to be glass. I use an, an enormous amount of glass. Um, why do I like it? Because you can see right inside and it doesn't cloud up. You know, you see exactly what it is. You don't have to bother late with labeling. It's free if you recycle jars, which I do. And of course, uh, the tempered glass is really a good material because it absolutely will not break like ball canning jars, the mason jars that someone mentioned. Uh, but I have had very good luck with all kinds of different glass. I don't, not the thin ones, but they're sturdy, you know, like a peanut butter and uh, just numerous, you know, shapes and sizes. If they're thick, I've, I've never had one break and I use them in the freezer. And I, I am guilty of, leaving things in the freezer for quite a long time. And anyway, I've never had any breakage. So there are other good materials, uh, stainless steel. It's durable, unbreakable, and easy to clean. And other metals like aluminum and tin, which are natural materials are, are good too, but they're not quite as durable. Silicone is actually a hybrid plastic and, and rubber a combination of both. And there's been quite a bit of research. More research is obviously for any of these things is important to keep at it. But the research so far uh, basically has said that is, uh, silicone is generally a safe material. It's growing in use. It comes in many shapes and sizes and the seals are good, particularly on this brand. They're so good that you know, you're sitting there and you can barely get, get the thing open. But there are other many other brands that are less expensive. Um, so it's called Stasher. You find it in the food co-ops and it's often on sale. That's when, when I buy it. And I and these are silicone by what, the way the lids. I'm going to talk about more about that later. Uh, cotton cloth wraps. Uh, I use quite a, more and more I'm using the beeswax. The beeswax is, is basically cotton coated with beeswax. And it's great for as a top of something or wrapping around a whole vegetable. It works very well. I also use damp dishcloths, underlined damp. And I wrap greens and vegetables in them. And I go to the savethefood.com or I have, a, I have a book actually from that, the same group that runs that website. And I, I'm forgetting a lot of the time. So I go back and look and it's often, you know, you wrap like carrots. If you've just bought them, you just don't wash them, but then you wrap it in a damp cloth, but you have to keep it damp. Uh, the last materials are ceramic and bamboo containers. Uh, I haven't really used them that much. I, I love ceramic, but I tend to keep it like, oh, it's special. I, I, I don't want to use that for storing my food, but I could. And then bamboo. And there's an alert about bamboo. Those bowls I bought in Mexico, and I'm not positive they're 100% bamboo. I'm going to find out this year when I go back. I think they're 100% bamboo. This little canister down there, however, is made of something called bamboo fiber. That is not a good material because it's made with melamine, which is plastic. It looks beautiful, but it's, yeah, wouldn't, would not be a healthy material. So this leads to a sidebar about the lids. And I have a bunch of them there, but they're really, it's just the same thing. And it's, it's a sparse collection. One of the things that, uh, you know, I'm realizing more and more is 
uh, the container may be a wonderful container, but the lid is plastic. And so you have the same problem of leakage of toxic materials into your food. So silicone, you know, is a material that's, I think, quite good for a cap, but so is beeswax and, you know, you know, of course, glass, you can use a metal, a metal jar. And, but uh, there, of course, there are a lot of plastic jar lids too. So, you know, we just have to be mindful and move away from that. Um, so I have a few pictures. Uh, there's one person here I know who's seen seen my refrigerator. Where did she go? <laughs> uh, this is the it's a smaller refrigerator, and I have this was taken about four years ago. So I'm I'm my practice is oh it's you you saw my pictures. <laughs> anyway, a lot of glass jars. It's not perfect because I see a plastic, you know, the yogurt container. Which obviously, I just left stuff in there. But those, it's an it, it, ice cream. I forget that it's like a, what? What? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it's not 100%, but it's mostly, you can see it's good materials, silicone. Those are veggie bags made of cloth. Uh, with salad greens in it, and then the door, things not so much to worry about. And I'll talk more about those pint-sized ice cream containers that I used to use a lot and I'm not using as much anymore. So then this, I talked about doing a redo and I did this only within the last month. <laughs> and it took me a, really many hours this is the before, and you can see it's just really awful with so much plastic, it's embarrassing. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know where anything is, you know, nothing is labeled. And so I just put everything out on the my kitchen floor and <laughs> the, what, the after? The after. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's a nice montage. So those are mostly really good materials, you know, glass, uh, silicone. And I see this is an example that glass container has a plastic cap on it, you know, the kind that kind of lock in place. So I'm very happy with that because now I know what's in and I have probably have some glass jars down there somewhere. I really can't say. So the next one is that we have a small eight cubic foot stand up freezer too. And that this is an old photo. And when I used to, each one of those uh, ice cream containers contains lentils, chickpeas, black beans, all sorts of things. They're, they're really nice size because they hold two or three cups, but they're, more porous than you would want in a a food container. So I, I, but I haven't gotten rid of them, but I just try to, you know, rotate them more often. And they're not like a permanent solution, that's for sure. And then my pantry, this is where I, hundreds of, uh, honestly, I have more drawers than that. They're all just body jars I've picked up from, you know, food that I buy and it's all sorts of, you know, you know, beans and legumes and nuts and seeds and everything, everything good. <laughs> so let's switch to preparing, prepping foods for storage. Uh, And, I'm, and this is uh, oriented towards the freezer because that's really the go-to place for for storing food long-term. It's so wonderful. So I'm gonna give you eight tips. The first one is freeze foods as quickly as possible. And so there's, a, there's some little tricks to that too, but you don't wanna put something steaming hot into a freezer. That's not a good idea. So you have to cool it down, but 
you know, not you, you want to do it fairly quickly because they're from a food safety point of view. So sometimes I'll get out a whole bunch of ice cubes, put it on a tray and then put, you know, the food on a splaying it out and then it cools it down. But the other thing you can do is to just uh, freeze in small packages that helps it cool. Uh, speed up the freezing process too. Uh, number two, freeze foods separately and in portions to facilitate meal prep. Muffin tins are a great, so a lot of people are talking about freezing pesto or what's what do you call it? Pesto, <laughs> pesto. Uh, and, you know, they're, when you put in a, a jar, you know, the quart size jars, that, that's like four to six servings and a pint would be two to three servings. So you can get used to, you know, how many servings you're doing. Number three, use airtight containers to prevent freezer burn. That's sort of a obvious. And one thing that I learned is that, you know, often you need to repackage something that you've bought at the grocery store, like plant-based, which we buy a fair amount of, my husband likes them, plant-based burgers or plant-based sausage. And the packaging is, is kind of fragile. So if it's going to withstand free, you know, storage in the freezer, it's really got to be overwrapped, another wrap on top or rewrapped. Uh, number four, leaving room for liquids to expand. So soups and stuff like that, one half to three quarter inch. So it doesn't burst. Uh, five, blanching fresh fruits and vegetables is a great idea to preserve quality, color, and nutrition. You were asking about nutrition. And yeah, you definitely uh, want to protect the nutritious nutrition value. And you, you can check, like, say, the food.com is a great place to find out the specific uh, blanching times for foods because it's quite different. Uh, organize, number six, organize and label containers with contents and date. Uh, obvious, and a permanent pen is helpful, and a sticker that sticks, that's also helpful. I see often I'm reusing something else and uh, you, <laughs> I'm gonna share that I, I'm i always looking for a, another use for something. And so I went, I was at the airport and I saw them throwing away, you know, the labels for your food case, suitcase. So I just began picking it up and I, I found it a strip that long that didn't have anything on it. So I now go, when I go to the airport, <laughs> I dumpster dive and then I come home with labeling material that's very high quality. <laughs> uh, let's see, seven, follow the general rule to use frozen food up within eight to 12 months. And then of course there might be specifics and that's, that's when you have to go and find out more. Number eight is thaw foods safely. And that means in the fridge overnight, it's so easy to want to do a shortcut. And the microwave is fine or in a bowl of cold water. It is not fine to thaw out at room temperature or in warm water, total no-nos. And the good, the reward is that you can refreeze foods. If you've thawed them properly, you can you can refreeze them. So just a reminder that there are several things go into proper food storage. The, the practices that we've talked about and the containers together and mindfulness about the earth, honoring the earth and thinking about our legacy and uh, so important in helping to support good habits. So thank you. <laughs> oh, everybody should rest. Yes, yummy. We all like to eat, don't we? Whether dining alone 
or at a family meal or dinner out with friends food is a big deal and if we want mother nature to provide us with food then honoring the earth is the right attitude so when we get some food either eat it right away or store it safely for another day Cause yummy, we all like to eat. Yep. <laughs> plan what you buy, then buy what you plan. Don't waste water, don't waste crop land. <laughs> For the short term, put food in the pantry or put it in the fridge. On the counter is handy. For the long-term dry, pickle or can it, freeze it in portions, or you can even jam it. For the sake of your health, it would be fantastic. Store food in glass, avoid using plastic. Expiration dates are just kind of a guide, so rely on your senses, your nose and your eyes. Yes, yummy, we all like to eat. Don't we? Whether dining alone or at a family meal or dinner out with friends, food is a big deal. And if we want Mother Nature to provide us with food, then honoring the earth is the right attitude. So when we get some food, either eat it right away Yum, or store it safely for another day. Cause yummy, we all like to eat. Yes, yummy, we all like to eat. That's great. Thank you so much, Ron. That was a great song. Um, and I just want to remind people that we did do a plastics reduction um, thing last fall over 10 weeks, 12 weeks. And I think the tips are still up on the on the website, aren't they, Anna? Yeah. So, you know, for, for I mean, it's on the Unity website, but we, you know, we did it by themes. So there were, you know, dining out, you know, cooking, holidays, things like this. So there were a lot of, we really made an effort to reduce plastics. I know I made a lot of changes during that um, campaign. So let's do this stump the chef thing. So um, for those of you that remember the splendid table in Lynn Rosetta Casper, yes. So she was on public radio. She had this little segment called Stump the Chef and people would call, call in and say, I've got a portobello mushroom, a half jar of Kalamata olives and some grape jelly. You gotta do something with it, okay? We're gonna be much kinder to you than that. <laughs> so do you wanna bring the, um, the ingredients up on the, uh, on the screen? Oh, there they are. Okay. So let's pretend that these are things that are in your fridge that are going to start going soft. You need to use as many of them as possible. Um, we're giving you some freebies because you have to be able to cook with butter, broth, olive oil, garlic, but we're also allowing you a spice of your choice, an herb of your choice, and two items of your choice. Okay. So let's give everybody, what, about 10 minutes maybe to work in, in small groups. We want you to come up with a recipe. You're going to report back to the rest of us, and we're going to give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down on your recipe. Hopefully, it's something that we would actually go home and cook. Let's give this a try. Hi. What's that? The rules, again, are that you need to use... Use as many of them as you want. The, 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 the final goal is to keep as much food out of the compost as possible, but to come up with a recipe that we would actually want to eat. Okay? I don't like kale, but I do have a kale recipe. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm a big kale fan. 
So just just to throw this out there because it doesn't use everything. But what I do is put some olive oil, you know, in the yeah, and heat it up and put in a whole bunch of because I have to cover the cheese with a whole bunch of onions. I do yeah, of, uh, garlic. Um, and uh, how about kale soup? I mean and, soup. <laughs> uh, well, and then. And, at the side, I chop the kale up and put some water, put some hot peppers in the door. Yeah. And cook that up. And then I take that and put it in with all the onions and the garlic. Yeah. And um, that's what I call it. Yeah, sounds delicious. I mean, every. It's a yellow pepper, perfect. Every single thing could go in a soup. <laughs> yeah. Like three.
Are we almost there? We're almost there. Okay, let's give you like one more minute to, um, and then we're going to have you report back. All right, we're going to have each group um, report back to us. And I think what we'll do is collectively give it a thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay, let's start with Dale and Janet. On tonight's menu, we'll have a salad with green onion, chopped green onions, carrots, like half bag of chopped kale, uh, oil rubbed to give it that banana, banana smell, uh, and four stalks chopped celery and sunflower seeds with a honey and lemon dressing with olive oil, salt, pepper, salt and pepper to taste. And then for our main entree, we'll have the um, two cups of rice uh, cooked. Uh, two cups of rice prepared. And over that, we're going to saute our quarter head of cabbage, a half a hot pepper, onions, a half, one and a half yellow pepper over the rice. And for dessert, we have the butternut squash chopped and sauteed with uh, pumpkin spice and brown sugar. Yeah. Winter is on its way and we looked at this list and thought soup. So um, start by chopping your carrots a little bit of celery. Our group is a little shy of celery. The green onions and the yellow pepper and saute those in a bit of oil. And then you add your broth and you add um, the cabbage chopped up, maybe hot peppers if you're interested in that. Definitely the squash and the yellow pepper and the kale. And simmer that for a while. And we were going to add tomatoes, probably the small diced ones in a can, or if you're at my house and you still have tomatoes from the garden that are ripening on the counter, then they end up going in there. Um, and some, some kind of bean. I voted for the Great Northerns. My partner here wanted garbanzos, but either would work. Um, some kind of bean. Those were our two additions. And for herbs, a good Italian mix with thyme and rosemary and basil and um, what am I missing? Oregano, yeah. And then as things come to a nice simmer after an hour or so on the stove, you throw in your white rice so that it starts to thicken it and give it some body. And we were gonna season it then with the lemon and the salt and the pepper and we forgot the garlic, so you gotta go add that back in. <laughs> there you go, there's our soup. Yeah. Um, so we were, we did this, as I remember the show, where you use as many ingredients in one dish. Okay. So, but we came up with four dishes and right. Okay. But they didn't all use all the ingredients, but the top one, I think that used the most, you just roast everything on the left. <laughs> uh, well, except for the rice and you put it over the rice, you know, you know, stir it up with oil and put your herbs on and salt and pepper and put it in the oven, roast it all and um, put it over rice. Right. Yeah. Ah. Okay, um, the second one that used the second most, oh, except for that, uh, oh, the, and the second one is soup. So then we thought, oh, everything except for the squash. We're going to do, bake the squash on the side. We're going to cheat a little bit here. So, okay, and we're, and so that's just, you know, uh, everything in soup and with the squash on the side. And then the um, uh, third one, 
would be, um, this was one person's idea, and I, I'm trying to wrap my head around this, um, but is blanch veggies for breakfast. So just blanch pretty much any of those, and then just mix them up in a bowl, and then just grab them, different ones, and eat them for breakfast. So, okay, now the fourth one, um, I'm the only one that came up with this one, is kale soup, because I hate kale. And I know it's super good for you. And I can't eat hot stuff. But when you put um, kale and tons of onions and tons of sweet pepper and tons of garlic and a little bit of hot peppers together, they all kind of like make what you hate like into something different. And I eat it all the time for breakfast. <laughs> I'll try it <laughs> for the breakfast people. I just put a little blob of it next to my fried egg. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. This is going to be fast. So we uh, we thought of a couple different things. First was just roasted vegetables over rice. So basically, roast everything on that left side of the of the um, of the list and and put it over cooked rice. Um, and um we also thought we could maybe use the kale as if we didn't roast it with the other vegetables we could use it as a kale salad or kale chips um but the other thing that we were thinking about is vegetable soup and we could just chop up everything that's there uh except for the hot peppers we would use that as a condiment and then we could either have it chunky or we could just throw it in the vitamix and puree it all and we're done <laughs> First of all, everybody copycatted everybody. <laughs> this afternoon, we're going to have a salad with giraffe. In the dressing, there's um, olive oil, vinegar, garlic, lemon, and oregano. And then in the salad, there's chopped carrots, celery, green onions, cabbage, yellow peppers, salt and pepper, and homemade croutons. I'm not sure we can top that. Honestly, that sounds really good. Uh, we went with curry over rice. So bear with us a second here. The first things you're gonna do are use that butter and clarify it into ghee. You're gonna use that to fry up the small dice of the baby carrots, celery, and green onions into a sofrito, which we know is not normally a curry thing, but we're doing it for more body. <laughs> um, while that's happening, we're gonna roast the squash in cubes with the olive oil, the garlic, and salt and pepper. And then, um, Fry up the yellow peppers, cut up, and some of the spices and stick in the hot peppers whole so that they can fry up with there and more of the ghee. You can remove them if you don't like hot peppers. Um, once the pepper's soft, you add in shredded kale and uh, then you add in the roasted squash and your chickpeas, which have been soaked or in a can, whichever you prefer. Add in some broth, let it simmer for about a half hour or use the Instant Pot, longer if you like. Uh, you're going to add one of our freebies is the spice of choice. You can use a Thai curry, red or green. You can use a garam masala. You can use a curry mix. You can dealer's choice. When you get near the end, you're going to smash up parts of the chickpeas and the butternut squash. So you end up with that nice kind of thick curry without having to add any coconut milk or something like that. Serve it over the rice. We didn't manage to use the cabbage. Sorry. Uh, but we did use our second freebie as chocolate bars for dessert. <laughs> can i have that oh my gosh this is this is awesome and we did sort of a, a variation of roasting vegetables and then elaine and i were going to make a, a a minestrone you know much as other people um um suggested as well but then all of a sudden i was thinking about frittata as well you know, I mean, you can throw any kind of vegetables in a pan with garlic and onion and then throw some eggs over it, and make it into some kind of a frittata. So um, 
This is wonderful. Thank you so much. Is this stuff that you would do? Excellent. Well, I want to thank um, First Universalists for sharing all their wisdom. Okay. We've got some good, good ideas and some resources to turn to to do just a little more. It's all a journey. We're not, actually, I don't think any of us are perfect, and we probably never will hit that bar. But if you just try and take one little step at a time, um, you're on the path. So there you go. All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions or comments, I think we'll just close out with the. Yeah. And you do it with cashews. There's a lot of wise people in this room. We need to mix <laughs> even more. Yeah. Okay, the question is a worry about shattering glass in the microwave. No, <laughs> I, I mean, I do, I do, I've just had good luck. And I guess, you know, it, it is always a concern of something super cold going into the microwave. So let it thaw for a bit, put it, or sometimes I'll put, you know, a pan of water and then the glass jar inside that at a lower temperature. That would be, yeah. Yeah. I've done that before. Although some microwaves don't, don't do that. Like mine. <laughs> <laughs> nice um yeah so just one other thing that i i do that wasn't mentioned there is the instapot is a fabulous tool for like stuff that's like in the freezer you can steam it so um put you know like one to two cups of water in the bottom of your instapot and then whatever container you've got hopefully not plastic because that will be very bad for you um you know, and then you heat it up, you put it on steam for like eight minutes. And I've done that with a lot of different things, or you can just, you know, web search, whatever it is, how, you know, I've like taken frozen chicken and, you know, they, you know, searched for how long I put that in the Instapot for, you know, on steam or whatever. And it works, works really nice. Um, I also, instead of if I'm using tempered glass from the freezer, instead of starting it in the microwave, I'll put a bowl in the sink and put the jar in there. And then you run just drops of cold water on it. Like you're doing a real dribble. And it does the same as thawing with cold water, except faster because you've got that water moving. If you've got half hour, it will only take, depending on how big it is, to an hour. You can thaw it that way. Otherwise, if you need to get it in the microwave faster, it'll thaw within you know, 10, 15 minutes to where you can get it out of that jar and into something else. So that's 
just yeah you don't want to put it in the microwave probably <laughs> probably <laughs> All right, great. Everybody has, everybody has some great ideas. All right, well, we will go ahead and extinguish our chalice. As we extinguish this chalice, we feel the strength and beauty of the planet and its people. Remember that as we go out into the world, we will continue to work to respect, uphold, and partner with these beautiful forces. <laughs>